<clears throat> Amazing. So hello guys, I uh, hope you guys are all well and having a lovely week. So tonight, Middlesex University Product Design, Product Design Engineering and Design Engineering are really excited to host the 14th talk in the annual guest lecture series. So this series runs weekly throughout the academic year on Thursday evenings, bringing together a mixture of vibrant speakers from across the full spectrum of design and engineering, a mix of leading practitioners, opinion leaders, radical thinkers and emerging talents to inspire and support your professional development. Tonight, we're delighted to host Philip Slingsby, Anna Bulls and Verity Andrew, partner, patent attorney, and part qualified patent attorney at Slingsby Partners. Who's Philip? So Phil's a patent attorney and a managing partner of Slingsby Partners. He specializes in obtaining protection for inventions and designs, and he advises businesses and designers on how to maximize the value of their intellectual property. Phil has uh, over 25 years of experience in license negotiation, alongside representing clients in IP disputes um, globally. Anna, Anna Bulls um, is a patent attorney. Following the completion of her physics degree at um, Exeter University, Anna joined Slingsley Partners as a trainee, has been in the profession for almost five years now. She, um, she has experience prosecuting patent applications in various countries, um, particularly in the field of graphics processing and healthcare technology. And Verity Andrew joined Slingsby Partners as a trainee in 2020 during the pandemic. She has a physics degree as well from the University of Bristol. Uh, Ver Verity is a part qualified UK patent attorney, and she's in the process of taking further exams and hopefully qualify as a patent attorney. She works in the electronics and healthcare sectors um, at Slingsby Partners. Guys, as usual, feel free to gather your thoughts, your questions, your comments in the, in the chat throughout the talk. We'll have Q&A at the end as well, so feel free to populate the chat with questions. And there's an option to go live and interact with Phil, Anna and Verity after the main talks. And now over to Philip. Anna and Verity with a talk titled Intellectual Property for Designers. Great, thank you, Ahmed. Um, yeah, so kind of as Ahmed was saying, what, what most of what we do is uh, helping advise clients how they can best protect inventions and designs and sort of organizing, getting that protection for them. Um, so this presentation is just to give you a brief overview of what intellectual property is and how it might be relevant to you as designers. Um, so the first point is what is intellectual property? Um, defined in the dictionary as an intangible creation that's the result of human creativity. So in other words, um, an idea as opposed to sort of something physical. Um, so uh, some aspects of the law um, enable you to protect your physical property, uh, for example, from being stolen. Um, intellectual property law is organized to stop stealing of ideas. Um, so those ideas might be contained in a few different um, forms. Um, so they might be contained in words, logos, uh, designs, objects and products. And these are associated with different types of IP protection uh, listed here. Um, so the IP law provides sort of mechanisms by which you can protect those sorts of ideas. And when we talk about protect, what we mean is stopping other people using your idea without your permission. Um, and usually that means stopping them from using your idea, making it, selling it, um, among other things. <laughs> Um, so these are the main types of IP protection available in the UK. Uh, so we've got copyright, trademarks, patents, and design rights. Um, I think outside of the IP industry, these all tend to get quite mixed and confused. Um, I didn't really know what the differences were until, until I started doing this job. So it's useful to kind of understand the differences between them and what each one is used to protect. Uh, so kind of taking this McLaren car as an example, uh, there are lots of different types of intellectual property protection associated with different aspects of the car. Uh, so starting with uh, design rights. So design right will protect the appearance of an object or part of it. So this illustration represents a design application which will protect the kind of overall look of the the car as a whole, um, but there are likely to be design 
applications which um, protect smaller parts of the car. So it might be just the design of the wheel or the headlight or something within the car, like the seat. And that's just um, relating to that part's appearance, so kind of nothing to do with how it works. Um, trademarks are used to protect logos and sort of branding. So this logo as a whole will probably have a trademark associated with it. Um, there might also be trademarks associated with smaller parts of the, the logo. So may, maybe just the red curve shape might have a trademark associated with it. Uh, patents, <clears throat> which is what we mainly deal with, um, is to do with inventions. So sort of how something functions um, and how it improves on things that have existed before. Um, so then there could be up to maybe a hundred patents associated with this car. So this example relates to just the rear wing of the car, um, but there might be patents directed to lots of other parts of the car, like parts of the engine, uh, maybe how the door opens, uh, parts of the wheel, et cetera. Um, and then copyright, as we'll talk about in more detail in a moment, um, is used to protect literary, dramatic, musical and artistic works. So uh, it may be used to protect the McLaren car handbook. So the kind of the text included in that handbook will be protected. So just to go into a bit more detail about copyright, first of all, um, as I said, it's used to protect literary, dramatic, musical and artistic works. Uh, so that's things like books, paintings, dances, songs, films. Um, unlike other types of intellectual property, we're going to talk about uh, protection for these things arises automatically. As, so as soon as you've finished writing the book or making the film, you as the author have copyright in that thing. Um, there's no need to apply to anyone to get that protection granted. It just happens on its own. Um, and, and then the next question is, who does that right belong to? And it's kind of dependent on exactly what type of work you've made, but um, it's generally speaking the author in the majority of cases, so the person who first creates the work. And that right will last until the death of the author plus 70 years. So once those 70 years after the lifetime have passed, uh, anyone will be free to use that work as they please without um, committing copyright infringement. Uh, so there are lots of, again, within a single work, there are lots of different elements which can be protected by copyright. So taking this book as an example, the text and story will be copyright in the text and story will, own, uh, will be owned by the author. The cover art rights to that will belong to the illustrator. Uh, the typographical arrangement, so that's sort of how the book's laid out and the formatting and uh, font, etc., cetera, um, will be owned by the publisher. And then um, in the film, there'll be further types of um, copyright. So uh, the film itself, copyright in that will be owned by the principal director and producer. The film script, so that will be the kind of literary work rather than anything audio or visual, um, will be owned by the script writer. The film poster will be, um, rights to that will be owned by the designer of the poster. And the score, the film score, so probably the music um, as it's written, as well as the sound, will be owned by the composer. And then if that's turned into a soundtrack, like a CD, that will be owned by the producer. Um, there's a recent update to copyright law, which says that 
characters can also be protected um, with copyright. So you can, it kind of provides some limitations on copying characters, even if you're not copying them in the exact form they were initially made. Um, and we'll come back to this in a minute. So the next question is kind of what constitutes infringement of copyright? Um, so infringement generally means that you're using someone else's work without their permission. Um, and that could be reproducing their work, storing it, communicating it to the public. Uh, for example, um, playing a film in a public place that you don't have permission to show to the public might be an example. So there are some kind of rules about when a work will qualify as, as being a cop copyrighted protected work. Um, and this, the kind of main thing that the work requires is that it must reflect the author's own intellectual creation. It can't just be something generic that has already existed, basically. Um, there's no minimum word limit for a copyright work. So it may be that if, like, you know, a, a literary work doesn't need to be a whole book to qualify um, for, in order for the author to have copyright in it. There's no, there's no minimum limit. Um, and in one particular case, it was found that um, an 11 word snippet of a news article uh, had copyright in it. So someone copying that uh, 11 word snippet was found to um, infringe the copyright of the author who wrote the 11 words. Um, and infringement requires not just copying um, a part of a copyright protected work, but a substantial part of it. Uh, so the question is how much needs to be copied to constitute a substantial part. Um, and it's generally a case of quanti uh, quality rather than quantity. Um, so the more, the more abstract and simple the copied idea, the less likely it is to constitute a substantial part. Um, so as an example, within a three minute song, um, copying a minute of it, which is kind of generic uh, music that's existed before and is very similar to lots of other things, is less likely to constitute copyright infringement than copying a five second portion that's very distinctive and is more clearly reflective of the author's own intellectual creation. Um, so that just going back to the character example, um, a recent case uh, found copyright um, subsisted in the character of Del Boy from Only Fools and Horses. Um, so, uh, the company Shazam Productions Limited, which was related to the family of the scriptwriter of Only Fools and Horses, brought a claim against the creators of uh, an interactive dining experience called Only Fools the Kushti Dining Experience. <laughs> um, and they'd sort of taken characters from the Only Fools and Horses series into a pub quiz setting. Um, so kind of they're using the characters not within the same format of a TV series, but in a different environment. Uh, and this is kind of quite a notable case because it found that the Del Boy character as described within the Only Fools and Horses scripts was protected by copyright as a literary work. Um, and it had been infringed by the creators of the people who made the, the Del Boy dining experience. Um, and kind of the main factor in deciding that was that the, the character of Del Boy was clearly a reflection of the author's own intellectual creation, um, reflected the author's personality and expressed the author's free and creative choices. So there are some defences to copyright infringement. Um, so those are private study and teaching. So for example, as showing uh, 
copyright works in this presentation wouldn't constitute uh, copyright infringement because it's for a teaching purpose. Um, as long as you do all of these things. So uh, sufficiently acknowledge that the work belongs to the author, so as long as you're not claiming it as your own. Um, and then there's an aspect of the law referred to as fair dealing uh, and some kind of factors which contribute to whether it's determined that fair dealing has happened um, is uh, includes whether the amount of work taken is appropriate. Um, so if we'd included the whole of a Harry Potter script in this presentation, that probably wouldn't, wouldn't um, be seen as an appropriate amount of work to have taken. But just showing the front cover of, of a book is probably more of an appropriate amount. Um, and the effect on the market of the original work, so how much the um, potential infringement would impact maybe the sales or reputation of um, the original copyright work and the author of that work. Um, but generally speaking, it is advisable to seek permission from the copyright owner for any copyrighted work that you're planning to use. Um, and there's kind of a lot of different mechanisms by which you can do this. But with songs, for example, there are websites such as Licked, which you can obtain a license to a song from the copyright owner um, so that you're sure that you're not committing copyright infringement. Uh, so now we're going to talk about trademarks. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, a trademark is a different type of intellectual property right. Um, these are all examples of different trademarks that you probably will recognise. Um, and these are all kind of visual trademarks, like logos, uh, logos and symbols. But there are other types of trademarks. So you can have um, like a jingle can be a trademark. Um, you could even have a colour being a trademark. Uh, but the main kind of main purpose of it is to uh, let the consumer know where the product or the service that you've purchased has come from. So, um, you know, if you were going to buy some trainers with the Adidas logo on them, you would expect them to have come from Adidas and have the quality of Adidas that you expect. Um, and so it's just kind of way of, kind of putting your mark on products and services. Uh, um, yes, so any sign really. So yeah, like I said, it doesn't have to be a logo. It doesn't have to be um, a picture. It, it can just, it can just be like, um, it can just be a color even if it's on the right product um, and it's limited to that product. Um, so like the Verve Clico champagne is trademarked orange. If that color is on a bottle of champagne. That's a trademark, um, but yeah. So as long as it, you can determine the source of the product or the service. Um, and yes, it has to be registered. So a trademark doesn't just um, arise naturally, like when you sell your product, you have to register it uh, to be able to enforce, enforce it. And they can, um, they can theoretically go on forever, as long as you renew them every 10 years. So um, yeah, so once you've got it, you can keep it for a long time. Not like copyright. Oh yeah, so this is a Toblerone. We all know that it's a Toblerone, and we know that it's Toblerone because that shape is very distinctive, and it does also have Toblerone sort of written on it. But the point is that they've trademarked that shape because it's very distinctive, uh, and you know that when you look at that, you know where it's come from. Um, so that's an example of a slightly unusual trademark. It's not in the logo. I mean, they do have a trademark for the logo, but it's in the shape as well. They've got it for the shape of that chocolate bar. Um, and recent, I didn't realize this, but in like 2017, um, Outland tried to make a Twin Peaks chocolate bar that <laughs> looked like this, where it has two peaks instead of one. Um, and they even tried to put it in similar wrapping to the Toblerone wrapping, uh, but um, Mondelez, who own Toblerone, didn't let them uh, market that product 
quite rightly, I think. Um, so instead it looks like uh, this alternative version, which I think they decided is sufficiently different for you not to get confused between the two. At least the packaging is very different. Um, yeah, so that's trademarks. Um, patents are uh, used to protect inventions um, as opposed to um, signs. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, and a patent is territorial, so you have to apply for a patent in every jurisdiction that you want protection in. So you might have a UK patent that protects your invention in the UK, but that doesn't mean that you can stop someone from using it or selling it in the US, for example, if you don't have a US patent. And the requirement for a patent to be granted is that it must be new and inventive over what already exists. So we spend a fair amount of our time prosecuting patents. So we try someone files a patent application and we kind of have a back and forth with the patent office in whichever country that they want the patent. And we try and explain why it's novel and inventive if, if necessary, sometimes they just go straight through. Um, but yeah, that's a requirement. Um, and they last 20 years from the date of filing, uh, provided that you renew them every year once they've granted, depending on the country. So there are some things that you can't get patent protection for. This is uh, an extract from the UK Patent, patent Act. Uh, so yeah, this list of things, things that you're not allowed to patent as such. So you're not supposed to patent mathematical methods. Um, that second one, 2B, is kind of covered by copyright. So you would get copyright protection for a literary work instead of patent protection. Um, and you might notice that it says you can't patent um, a program for a computer, uh, which is kind of taken with a pinch of salt because there are certain situations where you can patent uh, computer programs uh, depending on what effect they have in real life. Um, but it's generally like if it was just something that was run on the computer and didn't have any special technical effect, then you wouldn't be able to patent that. Um, and there are also some things like um, you can't patent methods of surgery in this country um, and some other biological things. Uh, so, yeah, it doesn't apply to everything. Um, so patents uh, are fairly expensive, um, depending on, well, compared to other types of uh, intellectual property, right? I mean, copyright just arises automatically. Um, yeah, so these are the rough costs associated with filing a patent. Um, you do, once it's granted, you do also have to pay renewal fees every year to keep, keep the patent in force. Um, but it depends how complicated your patent is to draft, that will affect the drafting cost. Um, and depending on how many applications you file in different countries will affect that as well. Because like I said, you have to file a patent in every country that you want it to be protected in. So that can end up being expensive. Oh, is this me? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so Anna and Verity have explained uh, if we go back to the car that Anna was talking about, that you can get protection of different types for the same product. Uh, and one common area of overlap, uh, especially we found doing these talks in the past, uh, one area of overlap that comes up quite a lot in the kind of things that uh, I anticipate you guys might be working on is that it's possible to get design protection and patent protection for the same product and so we thought we'd say a bit more about how those two overlap so to recap what Anna said uh, designs protect what something looks like 
irrespective of how it works. And patents protect how something works independently from what it looks like. Um, to protect how the thing works, we have to define what it is that the invention is, that the invention that governs how it works. And to do that, when we file a patent application, we have to write that down in a way that forms a legal definition of what the invention is. And those legal definitions go into a set of what are called claims at the end of the patent. And those claims set out what the scope of the patent is. We've got some examples later on of what these claims look like. Um, and uh, those claims are what gets examined by the patent office. And they also govern uh, later on, once the patent's granted, they also govern uh, whether or not somebody else is infringing your patent. Uh, what else does this slide say, Anna? Thank you. <clears throat> ah, yes. Okay, so in, in contrast to what I just said about patents, where the scope is defined by these claims that we write, uh, the scope of the a protection of a design is defined using images. So going back to the example of the car, there was a an image in the top left, which was a, a sort of simplified, somewhat stylized version of the uh, actual car. And when we're thinking about whether someone's infringing a design, what we're doing is comparing what they want to do uh, with those images that are in the design registration to see whether the potential infringement is too similar or not to the uh, uh, to the registered design. Uh, and like I said, there are lots of products that could have uh, both design and patent protection in them. And I think there might be one on the next slide. Yes. Uh, so this is a bedside crib. Um, it's a sort of folding travel thing that you can take with you and uh, unfold it when you get to where you're going and uh, put your baby in it so it can have a comfortable rest. And, uh, and on the left is a picture of the actual product. And on the right is a picture of the uh, of the frame that lives inside all the uh, kind of comfy bits of upholstery. And there are a couple of notable things about this frame. One is that it's got a patented folding mechanism. So to summarize how it works, you lift out that rectangular bit down at the bottom that goes between the legs. And then the two uh, sloping pairs of legs on the sides fold into the middle. Uh, and then uh, it's not shown here, but it all goes in a convenient bag. So you can put it in the back of your car or take it on the tube or however you want to carry it. Um, and uh, so there are there are two separate distinctive things about this crib. One is what it looks like. It's a, it's a nice piece of design as a an object to have around your house. Uh, and then secondly, it has this innovative folding mechanism that allows you to uh, erect it and then take it down and put it in its bag so you can carry it around. Uh, and if I remember correctly, when we go on to the next slide, oh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's some trademarks as well. So uh, in this next slide is an example. Uh, it looks a bit daunting, but here's an example of what a patent claim might look like. Um, I'll not uh, test your patience by trying to read the entire thing, but uh, I'll summarize it by saying that you'll see it lists where these indentations are. It lists a bunch of features like a cot body for receiving a baby, a first leg mechanism at one end of the cot body, a second leg mechanism at another end of the cot body, and a support structure attached to each of the legs between the upper and lower ends for essentially stopping them moving together or apart. And so those uh, four integers, if you like, in this claim are 
directed to the central part of the cot, the two end leg pieces and the bit that goes between the legs. And in words, what we've done is we've taken the technical idea behind how the folding mechanism works and turned that into this claim that defines what protection around the invention is. Uh, I think that's probably all there is to say about this particular crib. Maybe we'll come back to it if people have some questions. Uh, but please carry on. Um, so, to following on from what Philip's just been talking about about designs, um, there are a type of design right that um, you don't need to do anything for. So you don't need to register that just arise automatically um, when you make a product or to your design, uh, provided that your design's not very, very standard, but it's a pretty low bar. Um, and so it protects against um, people copying your design. So it's um, if someone created the same design as you completely independently and you couldn't show that they had copied from you, then you wouldn't be able to stop them from exploiting that design, even though it's the same as yours. Uh, so it's only really helpful if you've got a design that you're sure someone has copied and you can show that, and that's quite tricky. Um, but it's a it's helpful at least in the fact in the way that you don't have to register anything; it just exists. Um, and yet, so it lasts 15 years from when you created your design, or if you sold it or marketed it within the first five years, it lasts 10 years from that date up to a maximum of 15. So it does last a fair, fair length of time. Um, and you don't have to do anything to register it. So it's useful. Um, but probably what is more useful is having a registered design right. Um, so on the right hand side, you can see a pink LED face mask. Um, so that is a product that someone has registered a design right for. And on the left, you can see a figure from the design right application that's aiming to protect the front of the face mask, what the front of the face mask looks like. Um, so the left. So you register this design at the UK IPO or wherever, whatever patent office your the country that you're wanting protection is in. Um, and when you register a design, you have to submit um, drawings of what it looks like because you're protecting the appearance of, of your design. So that left image is one of the figures in the design, right? Um, and you don't have to prove that someone's copied your design to prevent them from exploiting your design. So it's um, a stronger right than an unregistered design right. Once you've registered it, provided you registered it before they um, copied, before they made something to your design, then you can prevent them from uh, exploiting it. And it does last up to 25 years as well. Um, and something you might so the the design of the face mask on the right is pink and has a flower pattern on the left cheek but the design drawing doesn't have that on it um, because you don't want to well generally you wouldn't file colored drawings in your design right because you don't want to say that the color is so important that if someone else was to make a green face mask it's not the same as yours because you filed a pink one, so they would be able to carry on with their green mask. You wouldn't want to limit your design to a particular colour and you wouldn't want to put that flower pattern on it either. Uh, and also you can't protect surface decoration and ornamentation on your design right anyway. Um, and so for there are some requirements for your design right to be able to be registered has to be uh, new and have individual character. Um, so they would check to see whether this already exists, but as we'll come on to a bit later, the differences in designs 
can be quite small, but they can still produce a different impression on the user. Um, so things that you might not think are new can still be considered new and to get a registered design right. Does anyone want to um, so this just kind of runs through the process of getting a registered design granted um, and you'll see it's a lot cheaper and quicker than getting a patent granted. Um, if you recall the earlier slide, sort of filing a patent application initially costs usually between three and five thousand pounds, whereas uh, it's 50 pounds to file one design. And if you file a few in one go, the price per design will reduce up to 50. Um, and in comparison to patents where the examination can last sort of three to five years, um, the design application is usually examined within two weeks, uh, basically because it's looking at a picture rather than having to read through a lot of claims and description of how an invention works. Um, and then after it's been examined, uh, it's either granted or the applicant is given two months to respond to kind of uh, explain why they think it should be granted. Um, and the renewal fees are also a lot cheaper than those for granted patents. So um, for patents, you have to pay a renewal fee every year for 20 years, uh, which are a few hundred pounds each time. Um, and in comparison for designs, the renewal fees are payable every five years um, and only go up to £140 for the final year. Um, so this is just going back to what would be considered to be, so you have a design registered design, a registered design, and you want to know whether somebody's kind of copied, somebody's infringing your design, right? This is just an example of two different designs and how so the one on the left is um a uk registered design for a um air spray uh, bottle um and the thing on the right is a competitor who um have a different design and um these two are considered to be sufficiently different uh to avoid any infringement so the air wick um, air spray doesn't air freshener air, spray, air <laughs> freshener doesn't infringe wasn't found to infringe p and g's air freshener design bottle on the left um and when they consider whether um two designs are one design's infringing another they consider the um, overall impression on the informed user so that's someone a bit more alert than the average consumer. So the details matter quite a lot, um, but as does the overall, like the overall impression of what the design looks like. Um, so that's just an example. Um, then we have, I think we have another one. Um, so this is another UK registered design for an ice bag. Um, and then this one on the bottom right is a competitor. Um, and so in this case the informed user is a user of bottle chillers um, and so it was decided that the informed user the chili bag on the bottom right wasn't considered to give a different overall impression on this informed user compared to the ice bag that was already registered um, in the top left so they found that the chili bag did infringe the ice bag design at the top left um, which I think is kind of fair they look pretty similar to me although I'm not an informed user of bottle chillers so what do I know <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are a few defenses with regards to design right infringement as well um, so kind of as Verity was saying before if you just have an unregistered design where you haven't filed anything at patent office, you've just uh, made your product and marketed it. Um, in order to catch someone infringing it, you have to show that they've actually copied your design. Um, so if they've come up with it on their own, that doesn't constitute infringement. You would have to 
probably get discovery of their uh, design drawings and uh, show that in some way that they've definitely copied yours. Um, whereas, as Verity was saying, for registered designs, you don't have to prove copying. Um, and similarly to copyright, there are defences which include private and non-commercial use and educational purposes. Uh, I think this is mine. Uh, yeah, so when some rights arise, it's very important to understand who owns them. In the first instance, at the point when the rights get created, and also later on, because that is very important to how you might want to exploit those rights. Uh, and as far as the first owner of the rights goes, the first owner is different depending on what kind of right it is. And we've listed here what are the most common situations. So generally, the vast majority of patents are develop, developed by people who are in product development or uh, engineering roles in companies who are developing products. And in that situation, the company that employs that designer is going to be the person or is going to be the entity that first owns the patent. And the consequence of somebody first owning the intellectual property is that they're the people who are allowed to exploit it or maybe sell it to somebody else or maybe license it to someone else in exchange for uh, a royalty. That's why it's important to know who owns it in the first place. Uh, for designs, it's quite similar. It's the designer or the person who employs them. Uh, for trademarks, it's a bit different. The first owner of a trademark is generally speaking whoever is using that trademark. And the reason for that is that, as Verity said earlier, the purpose of a trademark is to tell consumers which businesses products uh, are which so when you see a um, uh, when you see a Nestle uh, logo on uh, some chocolate product for the sake of argument you know where it's come from and so that's why uh, generally the first owner of a trademark is the business that is using or the person who is using that trademark and then finally copyright which Anna talked uh, about earlier generally the first owner of copyright is the author of that work so if you've written some computer code or you've written a book then you personally are going to be the person who is the first owner of that uh, work once the work has arisen and someone owns it in the first place, then uh, as it says here, you can transfer that ownership to someone else by what's called assigning the right. And so scenarios where that might happen are um, maybe uh, you've written a book, uh, but someone else wants to publish it and they say to you, I'll pay you a certain amount to buy this book off you and then I'll publish it. And they might want to do that by buying the copyright from you or similarly if you've come up with a design of a certain product someone might want to buy that design and the way they make sure that they have ownership of the um the rights to that design are by getting an assignment of that uh, design from you uh, so the other thing you can do with intellectual property is to license it so when you assign intellectual property that means that you transfer the ownership of that intellectual property to someone else and you've no longer got any rights in it at all. Uh, when you license some intellectual property, you keep the ownership of it, but you make an agreement with someone that they can use it on certain terms. Uh, you might say they need to pay you. It might be uh, that they don't need to pay you, but there are only certain, but there are some conditions on how they use the work. And uh, that point is going to be relevant to one of the questions I noticed that uh, had been posted in the chat, which we'll 
come on to later. So, so by licensing someone, you can impose conditions on how other people use that work later on. Um, a very important point about patents is that uh, the invention needs to be secret at the time you file the patent application. And so uh, that's why we've highlighted this point here, which, <laughs> oh yeah, it, it's animated. Uh, and uh, so when you, um, uh, if you have an invention that you think you might want to get patent protection for, it's very important that you keep it confidential until you've established whether you do want to file a patent application for it. Uh, what you'll probably want to do, and I think this is another one of the questions that's in the chat, which we'll come to in a few minutes. Uh, what you will probably want to do is to get some advice on whether it is patentable, uh, what you might want to do if you did want to patent it, uh, and then make a decision about how you want to, whether you want to file a patent application or not before you disclose it. Uh, this is really, really important because if you disclose it and then think about filing a patent application, then in most situations, in most countries, you won't anymore be able to get any patent protection for it at all. Uh, yeah, so one thing that it's very useful to do sometimes is to know what intellectual property other people have. Uh, one reason you might want to do that is because you want to launch a product and you want to see if other people have got some intellectual property that you might be infringing. Another reason you might want to do it is, uh, let's go back to the scenario we were just talking about, you might have an invention and you might be thinking whether you should file a patent application for it. You might want to do some searching to see how likely it is that it's going to be patentable, how similar it is or different to things that have been done before. And so uh, just in case they're useful to you, we've listed some sites here where you can go and do some searching. There are specialist databases that we use for this kind of searching, but these ones are all free and available online and uh, if you want to go in and have a play and do some searching you'll probably find Toblerone trademarks and uh, McLaren car designs and face masks and all sorts of other things that we've been talking about. Uh, okay so uh, our uh, our main objective here what we what we really want you to be able to do once we've uh, finish this lecture is to be able to uh, know what types of protection you might be able to get for products that you're designing. And once you know what types of product of, of protection you might be able to get, uh, then you'll be in a really good position to understand uh, what the right way to exploit that design is or, or what it is that you need to transfer to uh, a client maybe in order that they can uh, they can own it. Uh, and so to help with that, we've uh, got a bit of a quiz here. And uh, we've got five different things that there are multiple types of protection for, uh, a bit like the examples we've given already. And what we'd like to do is show them to you and then uh, ask you what types of protection you can get. Uh, maybe, uh, can neither of you see the chat? Um, I'm just wondering how we'll how we'll see people how we'll see people's answers. Yeah, if you could if you could just answer in the chat, and I think we'll be able to see it on the screen when it pops up. And if not, perhaps Ahmed can uh, help us out. So question okay. one. Question one. Um, so question one is what kinds of intellectual property might be involved with this Kit Kat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's like. I was going to finish out out for the just for the <laughs> anything that you think might be on this Kit Kat or involved with this Kit Kat. Go for it, guys. You can uh, populate in the chat if you guys want, or you can uh, unmute yourselves and speak uh, to, um, shout out the answer if you wanted to. It's not a trick question. <laughs> there are very many answers to it. Um, yeah, logo <laughs> trademarks, the graphic design, the shape. Oh, yeah. So the shape of the Kit Kat is a good one because 
that is very distinctive and that has been trademarked, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the logo is definitely one that's a trademark. Um, anyone else? Anything else? What else is on there? All, all those answers, I didn't quite see yeah, whose like answers they, they were, but they were all correct. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this, I guess that is a trick question because it's not in the photo, but there is a slogan associated with the Kit Kat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe copyright yeah. for the recipe. Maybe that is a good one. It. Yeah. To stop all the biscuit going down yeah. to the bottom. Oh, it could be a trade secret. Um, yeah. And a patent in the manufacturing process, perhaps. I'm sure there's a special Kit Kat manufacturing process that happens. Yeah. They must come from somewhere. <laughs> they are made of their own Kit Kats, though. It's very confusing. The inside of a Kit Kat is crushed Kit Kat. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, they must <laughs> How did they start? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, question two is the same question, but with regard to this trunky suitcase. Again, not a trick question. I feel like the trademarks may be easiest. Okay. <laughs> um. Go for it, guys. Uh... <laughs> So yeah, there'll be design protection available for the overall shape of the trunky. Yeah, there'll be a trademark associated with the trunky logo. There might be a patent mm -hmm. associated with the locking mechanism. Um, maybe something in the zip or <laughs> the wheel. Yeah, not really much to it, is there? But um, yeah. And there could be design attached to design racks attached to kind of smaller parts of the case as well, like maybe the shape of the horn or the handles or the wheel, something like that. Okay, question three. <laughs> yeah, what type of intellectual property protection might be? in this Spider-Man movie. I think Tony Smith has got top marks so far. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> I really <laughs> <understand>. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Marvel logo, character. yeah. Character, yeah, definitely. Yeah, which, names which the characters. Character? Doctor Strange. Spider-Man. <laughs> um, yeah, the name of the yeah. character. Yeah, yeah, maybe Doctor Strange could be a trademark. Yeah. Spider-Man's definitely a trademark. Yeah, and sure. that is the name of a character. Pretty much everything. Yeah, I think possibly, possibly not patents. I mean, I, I don't know what I'm not. Mm -hmm. I should have done my research better. I'm not quite familiar with what these kind of three-pronged spiky things that are attacking Spider-Man are, but yeah. if there's some kind of mechanism, then maybe a pattern. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there's probably a pattern in the like... Yeah, the working mechanism, exactly. It's an octopus, so, is it? I think so. I think that's the answer. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so top marks again, Tony Smith. <laughs> and great imagination. <laughs> <laughs> as well yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and many more <laughs> pretty much all of them as someone else whose name i missed so <laughs> yeah um what about the land rover um this is a very old land rover it looks like I can't see the whole of Irene's comment there. Ahmed, would you be able to read out 
comment as we can't sure see. of course uh, irene is uh, i think she was touching on the uh, spider-man marvel she's she's saying that everything that was made by computer would be copyright and this is it's, i guess it's a bit of a statement and also a question she means everything post-production and all of the animations stuff uh yes yes definitely i mean they would be they would be part of the final movie so they would be something that you uh get right in uh but, uh, just because it's a um uh, just because it's a film uh, but possibly there could be uh copyright in the programming that goes into the things that do the animation as well and probably a patent in the cgi yeah like graphics processing figures yeah um but I don't think computers designed this Land Rover. No, it's much more basic. <laughs> um, well, there was actually a um, design. So the, well, I don't know if you're one of the answers. For what. <laughs> but the Land Rovers tried to trademark the boxy shape of the Land Rover, um, which I think they struggled. I think they, I think they did get it, land, it granted. Um, like this sort of the very square look of the Land Rover. They got that trademarked. Um, so there you go, there's one. Oh yeah. But yeah, designs in the way the car looks, like the bonnet, maybe the steering wheel. Don't know what that looks like. Yeah, trademarks for the logo and possibly the shape. I think the shape is trademarked. Yeah. And like Anna was saying with the McLaren, um, car they've there will be lots of patents involved with a car the, like all the parts of the car anything that was maybe um inventive all the mechanical things that probably have patents for but they might be expired now because they were probably made over 20 years ago the last one's yours the last one is mine yeah so this one's a bit different because this is um uh well some dishwasher tablets which are mainly chemical really the smell the smell well you might get a trademark for the smell yeah so de so de definitely a patent for the recipe uh i uh uh irene's definitely right about that i think you you could get a you could get a patent for the chemical compound that makes the smell if it's not a natural compound. Um, or maybe if there's a way that the stuff that makes the smell is incorporated into the dishwasher tablets so that when they've been in your kitchen cupboard for a few months, the smell hasn't all gone. Um, that was a good one. Tony just suggested, I think it was Tony, just suggested <laughs> uh, something about the way that you uh, open it being childproof. That's a really good example. Yes, that's exactly the kind of thing that uh, people would patent at this sort of product. Because it's something that makes a big difference to the customer. So, you know, the customer might buy genuine finish or they might go and buy uh you know aldi own brand or tesco's own brand or something and one of the things that uh whoever make finish uh will have on their mind is that they want their product to appear to the customer to be a premium product and one of the things that the customer will appreciate is the fact that when they have their finish in the cupboard it has some childproof features Yeah, design and the shape. Shape's quite distinctive. Uh, pattern for the recipe and how you make it, how you stick that red piece on. And a trademark for the logo. Yeah, and the name. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, there's a lot of questions in the chat. Uh... Tony's asked, is there a way to get patents for many countries, like an EU patent or something similar? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, would, exactly. you like to, would you like to do that one, Verity? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, 
Yeah, so there is a um, patent office called the European Patent Office, uh, the EPO, that grant one patent, you file one patent application, a European patent application, and that can get you protection in all of the European countries, as well as some other, so uh, not just Europe, the economic area, but Europe, well, we are included in the Europe <laughs> of the European <laughs> Union, as is Switzerland and Norway. Turkey. Turkey. So there's lots of countries within the EPO you can get, you start out with one patent application and then once it's granted, that, that whole process is done with one patent office as opposed to doing it in all of the European countries. Uh, and then you end up kind of doing what's called validating your granted patent in each of the countries that you want protection within Europe. But it does mean, so you do have to pay to keep your patent granted and it, you, to keep it in force in multiple countries within Europe, but you just have to file the one application with the European Patent Office to get potential protection for the whole of Europe. And uh, Tony just asked if it was like Schengen and the EEA, and it is very similar to that in that both of those are international uh, bodies or groups of rights that are set up by international treaties and the countries that are members of the Schengen area are the countries who signed the treaty that but probably the Schengen treaty I would I would guess uh, that sets up that area and similarly there's an international treaty that establishes the European Patent Office and the countries that happen to have chosen to sign that international treaty which as Verity says is separate from the EU um, the countries that have chosen to sign that treaty are the ones where you can bring patents into force through the European Patent Office. Uh, the next question is, how long on average is the process for getting a patent and how much would it cost? Um, I might just share the slides again. We'll just talk a bit more about. Yes, sorry, I skimmed over that bit. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Oh, you wanna? Oh. <laughs> Perhaps if I, uh, yeah. I, I can, I can, I can summarize it. <laughs> so it it, de it depends on how many countries you want to get it protected in, and how complicated the invention is, and how many objections patent offices raise to the. Um, uh, you know how how complicated they make it by trying to argue that it's similar to things that have been done before. Uh, but roughly speaking, uh, for a UK patent, you can expect well if you come up with some typical numbers based on what we've got here, you're looking at something like five to seven or eight thousand pounds spread over. Uh, generally three to five years, although you can get it done much more quickly than that. And then that will be multiplied by however many countries you want yeah. to do the same in. Yeah. And then, yeah, paying renewal fees once it's granted every year in each individual country in which you've got a patent granted. So it is, it is quite expensive, but it is a, a kind of... Uh, really high level of protection because you don't need to prove that anybody has copied it and the protection is directed to how the thing works which if it's uh, like we were talking about earlier how you provide child protection on some dishwasher tablets it might be a really important feature that drives millions of pounds of sales of the product Uh, yeah. We're just taking a look at the other questions in the chat. Layla said, can you search existing patents publicly? I think we've talked about yes. that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so... Um, we can send the links to those things as well. Or yeah. So, so Layla asked, 
can you search existing patents publicly? And the answer is yes. Uh, you can do it through the links that were in the slide just before the quiz, um, which uh, I'm sure you'll be able to see if you uh, if you go back and uh, take a look at those slides later on. And Leila's also said, do you have any advice for people who are hoping to get a patent? And I think as an initial step, if you are thinking you're interested in it, probably taking a quick look around what already exists in the field of your product is a good thing to start with. Um, just to kind of scope out the field and how many patents you think might be in the area. Um, and I would say probably speaking to a patent attorney. Yeah, definitely. It's it's not it's not something that you would want to try and do yourself because it's a very complicated area of law. Um, but but when you go to speak to a patent attorney about it, well, well, <clears throat> first of all, although the proce process is expensive, uh, most patent attorneys, certainly us, we wouldn't charge to give you some initial advice on whether the invention is likely to be patentable and how you might go about it. But one of the first things that we'll ask is how similar is this invention to things that have been done before? So if you've done some searching and, and you've got an idea about what the differences are between your product and other things that are out there, then that would be really helpful to whoever's advising you, subject to the point that I emphasized earlier that you it's really critical to keep the invention confidential until you've decided whether you want to file a patent application. Um, Harry has asked, actually I think it's a very good question, uh, for whole products as opposed to specific technology within the product, how would a patent differ? Is it recommended to have multiple patents? What's the best process to protect it? Um, so as Philip was talking about um, with regards to the crib, the, the scope of protection afforded by the patent is uh, defined by a claim and in that example, it was kind of a list of four features of the of the crib. I think it was like the main body, the two legs, and then another bit under the main body. Um, and so if you are wanting to get protection for a product, in a way, the best way to do it is to uh, get protection for the smallest part you can that you think is is the inventive bit. Because so, for example, taking the the McLaren car, if they if McLaren make a new uh, hinge for the door, um, if they get a patent that protects that hinge, so the claim will just talk about the hinge. It won't talk about any other components of the car. You know, it won't say it's on the car that's got wheels and a roof and an engine. It will just talk about the hinge. And that means that once that patent is granted, if someone else makes that hinge, even though it's not on a car, they put it on on anything, just on a door or like of a house or it, use it in any way that will still infringe the patent. So you want to kind of get your claim down to the minimum number of requirements so that you catch the most people who are potentially infringing, basically. And I, th I think was the question, would you have multiple patents? I think it was, is it better to have multiple patents or is it best to have one patent? Ah, yeah. So, so the answer is definitely that um, if, uh, if the business that's filing the patents can afford to do it, it's better to have individual patents for each bid. So let, let's, just, let's just take the example of that car. Suppose there's a patent on the rear wing and the hinge. Uh, if you have separate patents for those, then someone would infringe if they use just the rear wing with a different hinge or just the hinge, but you know, in a car that doesn't even have a rear wing. But that's, that's why you would separate these inventions up so that you've got protection for each bit by itself, isolated from the other pieces. Uh, Tony said, if you're unsure on whether you need a patent, is there an easy way to figure out if it's worth getting? I think that's kind of the same answer we gave before about doing a bit of your own searching and then making an appointment with a patent attorney because they'll probably have a bit of an idea about how the likelihood of success of any patent application that you would file. I think I think Amy means copyright.
Uh, yeah, okay. You mean the, you the copy left question? Yeah, so, so, um, uh, so whose question was that one? Irene. Irene, yeah. So um, uh, Irene asked about copy left and how that's different from copyright. So, so copy left is the idea that you release something to the public. Um, generally on the condition that if people uh, make derivatives of your work, that they'll also allow those to be released for other people to use. Um, and uh, this is the point that I was thinking about when I said that it was a good example of how licensing copyright isn't necessarily just about getting money in in the form of royalties. So if you just wanted to allow anybody to use your work without putting any conditions on them, then you don't really need to, I mean, you, you, you can uh, just uh, let everybody know that the work is free for use. If you want it, if you want to allow people to use the work, but subject to some conditions, then you have to have a way of making sure that people comply with those conditions. And, and the way that works is by uh, the, the, the foundation of copyleft is, is that there has to be copyright in the idea, but you license that copyright subject to certain conditions. And those conditions might be, you're only allowed to, use, you, you know, you're free to use my idea, but only on condition that if you make a derivative work, you will license it to people on similar terms. And the way that deal is enforceable on these people who might want to use your idea and make derivative works, the way it's enforceable is by the fact that if they, make derivative works and don't release them, then they're infringing your copyright because they haven't complied with the license. Um, Harry asked, are there other costs beyond a patent, pre-compliance costs, etc.? Oh, only that once you've got it granted, uh, you need to pay fees generally every year to keep it in force. But the fees, the fees for keeping it in force are quite small. They're of the order of you know, they start off at £150 a year or thereabouts. Uh, which one? Harry's, Harry's question? Yeah. What is the best intellectual, pro intellectual protection <clears throat> for startups or early design opportunities where funding is limited? Um, well, Design rights are probably the most accessible intellectual property. Well, it depends what you've come up with, but uh, if there's some some aspect of your, if you've made a product in it and it's got a certain appearance that you've put some time and effort into, then designs, getting a design app, design right, like a UK registered design, uh, would probably be the most um, accessible. I mean, because it, it's, quite cheap and it's not too complicated and it doesn't take very long to get registered and you do also have unregistered design rights as well which just exists like copyright just kind of automatically um patents might not be the most well it depends what it depends whether you've invented something that could be protected with a patent or whether it's more about what it looks like most most of our so we act for a lot of startup businesses and most businesses generally have some funding maybe maybe from the founders or maybe from somebody else but they generally have some funding before they file patent applications just because patent applications are quite expensive to file whereas as verity says if your if if your product is something where the appearance is an important part of it uh, then design protection is a is a much more accessible form of protection, but somebody might be able to make a product that works the same but looks differently. And then it might be outside the scope of your design protection. Uh, Tony asked a question of 
if you have designed a product and then after finishing the design, you found out that it's similar to an existing product you didn't know about, what would the legality look like in going ahead, in going ahead with that design? Um, I suppose that depends whether your competitor's design has a registered design right attached to it, because if it doesn't, then uh, you should, well, based on this example, you should be able to prove that you haven't copied it, so you wouldn't be infringing any unregistered design rights. Um, what would the legality look like? It's it's a bit hard to say without seeing an example because infringement of design rights is kind of dependent on how um, densely packed that field is with designs. So in some fields where there are fewer designs, um, you may not need to uh, you might need to change your design by quite a lot in order to avoid, avoid infringing a design right. Whereas in fields where there are lots of designs that are all very similar, um, only kind of a small difference will mean that you're not infringing the design. Uh, yeah, like with the air pressures. Yeah. Like small differences, they produce a different overall impression. Seems unlikely that you would have designed something exactly the same as someone's registered design, but I guess it's possible. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the first thing we would do in that situation is to try to understand what protection the people who did the first design had. Did they have a registered design? Um, did they have unregistered design protection? They might have, uh, whether unregistered design protection exists depends, for example, on where someone made the, where someone designed it. So there might not even be that. So, so the first step we would take if we were looking into that is to understand what protection exists. And then once we understand that, then we would think about, well, given the scope of that protection, is it even a problem at all? But as Anna says, maybe the, maybe your design, if you created it independently is actually not infringing this prior right. Uh, if we think it's quite close, then there's a few things you could do. You could consider changing the design a bit, a bit like the um, Twin Peaks thing that wasn't a Toblerone, change it so that it looks less similar, but still perhaps gives the same, a similar kind of impression to people. Uh, you could go and speak to the people who own the design and see if you can get a license from them. Uh, you know, maybe they're not selling their products anymore. Maybe they gave up, so they might be happy to sell the whole thing to you. Uh, so that, so there's a, a number of ways of, uh, e even if you think that the protection is quite similar, there's a number of ways of sorting it out. I think the final question is about software. How does it work with software? I think that's maybe a patent related question. Um, uh, who's doing that one? I like the way you do it. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, gen generally there's two types of protection you can get for software. There's copyright, obviously copyright just arises automatically when you write the software. Um, you can then get patents for lots of different types of software. The rules on whether software is patentable are to some extent different uh, in different parts of the world. Most importantly, they're different between the US and pretty much everywhere else in the world. Uh, but that's not insignificant because, you know, the US is a, a big market for many software based products. Uh, generally, the situation is that in order for software to be patentable, it needs to have some kind of, uh, and this is a, 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 an oversimplification of the law, but generally the situation is that it has to have some useful effect outside the computer. So if it is, for example, software for controlling traffic lights so that traffic can move more efficiently because you worked out that if you change the lights in a certain way, you get more cars through in a certain amount of time or software for um, estimating someone's blood pressure using certain information that you've gathered about, them, uh, then those that software is doing something useful outside the computer. It's, it's getting more cars around a city or giving people useful information about their health. So those types of software uh, are, generally speaking, patentable 
subject to exactly the same rules as any other type of invention. So it's got to be, uh, most importantly, it's got to be inventive compared to whatever has been done before. Amazing. Uh, no. No, amazing. I think that concludes uh, the questions there in the chat as well. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a superb set of questions there from the uh, from the students and participants. That was brilliant. And we'd like to take this moment as well to obviously say uh, thank you to um, Anna, the Verity and Philip as well. It was a superb overview of the intellectual property rights, copyrights, uh, trademarks, patents, design registration, great examples throughout as well to kind of contextualize and, and bring clarity to those definitions and, and terms as well. Um, and so thank you for taking out your time, joining us tonight. It was a brilliant talk, uh, it's a fantastic Q&A as well. And especially from all of the participants, you know, superb input throughout the, the talk. Um, so from all, all of us at Middlesex University, product design, product design engineering, design engineering, we thank you for your time and thank you for the talk. Well, thank you very much. Amazing. For all of you, the students, participants, um, uh, Anna, uh, Philip and Verity's details were sent to your emails ahead of the talk, including links to their website as well. Um, so definitely feel free to browse and connect. And to conclude as well, keep an eye out on your emails for the details of next week's speaker and talk. And until next week, stay well, stay safe, and thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks.